when my colleagues or you know people in the sort of mainstream establishment media talk about um, these issues, they often do talk about you know disinformation and they're talking about the distortions of social media and the way that it inflames many of our sort of intuitive tribal feelings about the world and the state of the world. I tend to think that the changes that we've seen over the last five years are are kind of bigger and more fundamental than that. I, you know, 20 years ago, people worried a lot about American culture trending in a, you know, kind of idiocracy, dystopia direction. We we worried about the the dumbing down of our population and of our culture. And, you know, I think there are certain ways in which that's undeniably unfolding. On the other hand, I think in the last five or 10 years, as this incredible explosion of pretty high-minded, pretty serious curiosity, you know, in other parts of the new media landscape. So you can see certain algorithmic problems when you're looking at, you know, Twitter or TikTok. But when you look at what's happening on YouTube or in podcasts, it seems to me like we just have a huge new population of people who demographically and professionally a half generation ago would not have been really intellectuals now playing the role of intellectuals in public, but also many of them just processing news from the world on their own. And, you know, on some level that has to be progress and it has to be a good thing. When I think about, you know, just imagining the equivalent like Silicon Valley elite from 20 years ago, they were just not, you know, listening to three hour uh, podcasts about, you know, some 17th century event or the, like, the, you know, the, the path of the plague through Europe or whatever, whatever it is. It just was it's a very different kind of more business centered culture. And that's true of more traditional business centers, too. And now I think almost everyone of some education and sort of status that thinks of themselves as a thinker and thinks of part of their job as figuring out the state of the world in the future. And that is, you know, like I said, you kind of have to count it as progress. On the other hand, it's meant that it's possible for many of us to treat those conversations, which are in many ways abstracted and separated from the, the, the way the real world is unfolding, as though those conversations are the real world and not to confront ourselves or be confronted with contrary facts or contrary arguments. And so we have this combination of forces where we have many people thinking and talking in much more sophisticated and informed ways, but producing just an awful lot of, I think, pretty damaging narrativization and mischaracterization of all the shifts that we're living through. And, you know, it's maybe because of what I cover and what I write about. It's also because of, you know, the recent history that we've all lived through. But I think of this, I guess, primarily in terms of the pandemic, where it almost seemed like every month I was both arguing with journalists at places like the New York Times about how they were describing the pace of the pandemic and the course of the pandemic and what it, what it sort of required of us, and also arguing with contrarians who seemed to be far too extreme in their rejection of establishment wisdom and establishment understanding. And I don't know, given the information landscape that we've landed in um, now in 2024, against the political backdrop in which all of that's unfolding, whether we can get back to a place where, you know, we have to argue from real facts with one another. But it does seem like a quite, quite distressing situation where, you know, you have pretty prominent people with pretty large followings and whose followings have grown a lot over the last five years talking about the net harm that vaccines have done to the population Mm. or, you know, on any number of points about the the course of the pandemic, really, really, I think, overcorrecting for some of the real oversights and shortcomings of conventional public public health messaging, but overcorrecting in, in ways that I think are, you know, have left us in a in a worse place. And, you know, there we could talk about some of the particulars there. But in the big picture, it's like half of states, I think, have passed laws restricting the ability of public health officials to impose any behavioral restrictions in the in the face of a future pandemic, independent of how transmissible or lethal that pandemic might be. Hmm. You, you, you know, reasonable, reasonable people can say, can take issue with the way that the American pandemic was handled. But like the idea that 
we should do absolutely nothing in the face of all possible future pandemic threats just seems to me to be just a horrible overcorrection and a real indictment of how, you know, how narrow-minded, narrow-mindedly we're all thinking about what we just went through and the lessons it really offers us.